Welcome to Make Your Money Matter with Brad Barrett, the show that aims to change the way you think about wealth management. Brad is a financial advisor, established radio host, and author of Retire Right. He is a managing director and partner at One Capital Management, an SEC-registered investment advisory firm managing over $4 billion for clients across the nation. Brad and his team are dedicated to helping clients protect and preserve their assets so they can reach their investment and retirement goals. And now, your host of Make Your Money Matter, Brad Barrett. Welcome in to Make Your Money Matter. I'm Brad Barrett. Ahead on today's show, we're going to talk about election years and what to consider, being that we are in an election year. We're also going to talk about budgets and governance as it relates to our own household, but really as a backdrop, given what the Senate and the House are going through right now when it comes to a budget deal. We're going to talk about that and make some correlations there. But before we get started, make sure to go to our website at onecapital.com. There you can download and subscribe to Make Your Money Matter show. You can also download and subscribe to the Make Your Money Matter show on any other platform, whether it's Spotify or SoundCloud or the Apple iTunes app on your phone. And leave us a comment and a review. It's good to share the message for us, and I always appreciate that. And with that, let's get started. Have you ever noticed that when talking about government in general or any kind of spending bill as it relates to our money or any sort of fiscal responsibility, it's a lot like cats and dogs or brothers and sisters? I have a 8-year-old son, Brooks, and a 6-year-old daughter, Kate. And as much as they're best friends and as much as they live in the same household and are loved by the same mom and dad, me and Veronica, and with the family around us, the supporting cast, if you will, they still fight like cats and dogs. You ever notice that somewhat like Democrats and Republicans when it comes to spending money and their views on it? I mean, Democrats and Republicans become somewhat like the brothers and sisters and the supporting cast of the family, cousins, grandparents, uncles, aunts, nephews, are basically us as U.S. Americans just waiting to see what brother and sister are going to fight over and kind of, oddly enough, what they agree on. So before we get into election year discussions, which I do want to talk about because I've had a few discussions with some clients lately, and I get it, and, and this is probably my fourth or fifth election cycle as a financial advisor, but in discussing you know, what needs to be passed by January 19th, which by the way, friends, is Friday of this week, right? The government evidently may shut down, as they've told us before. We saw this in 13 twice, in fact. Now, I think many economists out there don't think this will happen, but the fight over government spending seems to drag on year after year. You notice that? And the reason why I'm bringing this up is not to talk about politics. As you know, I don't like to do that on this show, but it's largely around how that relates to our money. Because in this particular situation, when it comes to government, we're talking about spending. Like we, do, like we do in our own households, right? Like us as advisors talk to you about cash flow, ins and outs, debt obligations, investing, savings, things like that. Now, it's not hard to understand or why this keeps happening. And I want to go into some details here. There's actually a great article written uh, by a guy named Brian Westbury, who's the chief economist for First Trust. And it actually went into this because, you know, look at non-defense spending by the federal governments. By the way, this includes entitlements like Social Security. This has climbed dramatically. So I'm going to give you some data just for a second to paint the picture, if you will. So again, non-defense spending, speaking that particularly by the federal government, was 10% of gross domestic production or GDP in the 1960s. It was 14.8% of GDP in 2001, 15.2 in 2007. And just to flash forward for a second, it's now projected at roughly 22% of GDP over the next five years after peaking, by the way, four years ago, at 27.7% in 2020. In other words, non-defense spending now consumes more than twice as much GDP every year as it did 60 years ago. Its share of GDP is up 45%, if you do the math on it, from just before the Great Recession in 08. And it's up 24% from the year before COVID-2019. As always, I mean, you look at this, right? Government continues to take more and more of what the private sector produces, and it's heading for annual deficits of about $2 trillion. I share this often because I think anyone in government in general who hasn't held a private sector job should really understand what the private sector goes through. I digress. But the Great Recession, if you look at that for a second, I brought that up, and COVID were one-off events. Let's just call it that. Obviously, they were dramatic. A lot of us who are listening here lived through that, but they were one-off events. Yet somehow, government spending never returned to the pre-crisis levels 
following either one of those. And that's what I think is interesting. Now, I mentioned last year when we talked about budgets and you talk about things like that. Essentially, we need to raise the limit. We did. And we're going to need to find this deal figured out by Friday of this week. But what I'm trying to get at here, and like I shared to, to bridge this for a second for all of us as individuals, not in government per se, is just what government needs to do is what we all need to be doing for our own finances, which is mind what is going out versus what's coming in. It's important. Now, many of us are rolling our eyes right now because it's like it seems so simple when it comes to government and we like to point the finger. But hey, before we do that for a second, let's ask ourselves something. Are we living within our means? Is basically what's coming in on income exactly what's going out with a surplus? Friends, I'll tell you this, of nearly two decades of being a financial advisor, I'd probably say 70 to 80% of the financial plans we run are reliant on other income, whether it's overtime, whether it's commissions from different things or something like, or other businesses, side businesses, to make our nut every month. So again, as I'm, I'm with you guys, I'm not saying that I'm you know in love with what government's doing in general, they need to get their house in order, but we do too. So we gotta be careful, as the good book says, to make sure to remove the log in our eye before pointing out the speck in someone else's eye. And so I bring this up simply to say that there's a lot of synergies, believe it or not, that we can make between government spending, government budget conversations, and our own financial plans. Now, when I going back for a second, right, it, you know, to, to a lot of people, a lot of economists, and Brian Westbury went into this too, is right, you know, this is why budget battles have turned consistently ugly, we feel, and a lot of people feel in recent years. I mean, you think about it, like repeated threats to not raise the debt ceiling or shut down the government because a budget can't be agreed on have become somewhat like commonplace, very normal. And it, all of a sudden the news outlets pick it up and then all of a sudden we get anxiety. Friends, you know what I'm talking about, don't we? So an ever-changing mix of politicians who want to see spending controlled, right? They, they're going to face heavy pressure from every direction and they you know, must go along to get along, as they say. But they still fight and fight, I think, is what they should be doing, to be fair, from both sides because hopefully if it's done maturely, there's a good outcome. Now, obviously, for all of us, and let's talk about the government for a second to stay on that train, when spending gets too high, economic growth slows, as do tax receipts. Now, last year, the CBO's budget forecast overestimated tax receipts by 11% and underestimated spending by 9%. The bigger government gets, the more likely this happens year after year. I want to share that again. I'm not throwing shade over here at the government. I'm not trying to pick on this right now. I'm just using this as a backdrop to our own financial life. Let me state that again. The CBO's budget forecast overestimated their income, otherwise known as tax receipts, right, for them, by 11% and underestimated their spending or what we would know as our spending or our cash outflow by 9%. That's a 20% total uh-oh. Now, again, as I share this, right, if you think about it, our own lives have a lot to do with that. And, and, and a lot of it we can control and some of it we can't. We can't necessarily control inflation. And you're like, well, Brad, Things have just gone so expensive, and, and my, my raise, my bonuses, or whatever it might be, have not been compensatory to you know milk and gas prices and, other, and food and just everything else. And I agree with that. But at the same time, this is why financial forecasts and plans help. Now, I'm not trying to downplay or diminish what you may or may not have done. I'm saying wherever you are right now, whoever I'm speaking to, whatever age or stage or season of life you're in, whether or not you're in this camp that I'm talking about, which is, by the way, the majority of clients I see, and I've been here too, personally, so I'm well aware of what this feels like. It's almost like, it's like quicksand. It's like you want to move, but every time you, you, you put one arm up, you know, you're, you're all of a sudden two strokes down. And, and I get that feeling, but I will share out of experience, with not just myself, but also with, with clients. And what we do as a firm here at One Capital is to, believe it or not, designing a plan and actually executing it will help. It will get you out of whatever scenario you're in. I'm not gonna say it's a quick fix, gonna happen overnight, but I'm gonna say this. If you build a plan and you can see the tunnel and you keep executing towards that, you will get there. Stay connected. Get frequent updates on the show. Follow Brad Barrett and Make Your Money Matter on most social media platforms. And catch full episodes of Make Your Money Matter streaming now on our YouTube channel. To schedule your no-obligation appointment, go to onecapital.com or call 805-410-5454. So the idea here is, is not to get down on yourself saying, you know, Brad, what you just described about government, I've been, you know, really kind of poo-pooing what they're doing, so on and so forth. But the reality is I'm doing the same thing. I'm, I'm basically underestimating what I'm spending and I'm overestimating what I'm bringing in. 
And if we are honest about that, we sit down, run the numbers and take a look at everything and then figure out a way to get out of the debt, figure out a way to create cash flow within your income without going and you know creating a new revenue source. Friends, there is a way to do this. And I'll tell you what, right now we're still in January. I don't know what New Year's resolutions he might have already given up on or maybe still sticking to, but now is the time to figure out your money. We don't want to be, what I'm trying to share here is we don't want to be like government, right? The last thing we want to do is be the pot calling the kettle black, right? We're pointing the finger saying, how could you do this? I can't believe you're talking about budgets and government. I can't believe you're raising the debt limit. Well, friends, we're somewhat at fault as well in our own personal lives. And I think we need to take ownership of that. That's okay. It's, it's honest to talk about. Say, hey, you know, I might've been underestimating what I'm bringing in. I might've been overestimating. Usually it's overestimating what I'm spending. So being honest with ourselves helps was the first step here. And just to end that note here on my rant, I guess, a little bit of budgets and governing and our own personal cash flows and financial planning. You know, a lot of people understand that the makeup of Congress creates difficulties for those who want to cut spending if you look at how it's spread out. And I won't get into details there. But calling them names and accusing them of not being able to govern, I think, perpetuates the problem. So out of control spending and huge deficits, as far as the eye can see, are the real failure in governance. There's a lot of things that we can glean on the person, a lot of nowadays with all the news background. But the reality is we need to, as voters and just in general, we need to take care of ourselves first. I would just put on your heart right now and say, before I you know, point finger anywhere else, am I living within my means? And if I am not, how, what am I, what's my plan to get to that point? Friends, that's where counsel comes in. This is not a do it alone situation. Find help, find counsel, find an advisor. You know, It's not a all roads leads to one capital here conversation, but this is what I like to do every week is to inspire and say, look, don't just keep going year over year overspending and thinking, oh, in a couple of years, I'll get an MOU adjustment or, or you know, a pay raise or a promotion. I mean, those might happen. That's great. But wouldn't you want to celebrate that versus just basically those new incomes are paying for last year's mistakes or last year's over outflow? Create some joy in your life through this. Believe it or not, it can happen. Now, switching gears for a second, has still on the, the topic of governance and, and uh, you know, government in general. You look, we're in a election year, friends. It's going to get hot and heavy here in a couple months. November is obviously a big time period. And again, not to get political, using as a backdrop for a second, I want to share with you some data. Now, this is just data and always need to be clear that past performance never guarantees or indicates future results. But I want to give you an idea. And I love this. What I, what I got here is a market performance over election years. It's actually a study done by Morningstar as of the end of last year. So December 31st. 23. And the stock market I'm going to be talking about here is represented by the S&P 500. And they went back to January 1st of 1926. Okay. And they went all the way through basically a couple of weeks ago, December 31st of 23. And what they're trying to share is what the stock market did. Okay. Not your portfolio necessarily, but just, just the market as a backdrop, just to give you some, you know, background, if you will. Right. The, basically the summation here is the first half of presidential election years, meaning first quarter and second quarter, basically January uh, to about June, July, the first half of presidential election years tends to be sluggish, but followed by a big second half. Now, real quickly, before I go through the numbers for a second, as I shared with you, as a financial advisor, it's like my fourth or fifth election cycle. And I've seen Republicans, I've seen Democrats, I've seen incumbents, I've seen new people, you know, and, and I'll share over that time period that, you know, it is an event. Don't get me wrong. It's an important one for our country, for the world. But for our money, it becomes a part of many other events that are going along the way. Just think, for example, conversations this year about federal funds rate and, and mortgage rates and other random things that are going to come through, uncertain things that are going to come through the markets, as well as things we know are planned. So this report that I thought was interesting, again, done by Morningstar, showed that the first quarter since 1926, up until end of last year, a couple of weeks ago, the first quarter in a presidential election year did about, on average, 1.3%. The second quarter did about 1.5%. Remember that the first half of presidential election years tends to be sluggish, but then followed by a big second half. The third quarter, on average, was 6.2%, and the fourth quarter was 33 By the way, again, I want to reiterate this. This is not about performance numbers per se, but it's to help alleviate some concerns for anyone out there kind of going like, hey, you know, election year, a lot of volatility, things like that. And I'm not, I'm not doubting that. I'm not, I'm not saying that that's not wrong. But if you look at the whole and the body of work 
because we always talk about this, right? It's about time in the market, not timing the market. So if you're in it for one year in a market perspective, then yeah, I would be a little more concerned about what's going on this year for sure. But if you are, whether I don't care if you're in your 60s or 70s here listening or in your 20s and 30s, you got a long-term perspective. And I know that sounds weird for someone who's 60 and 70 saying, well, wait a minute, Brad, I'm not 30 anymore. How do I have a long-term perspective? Well, as I share all the time, I'm like, don't you plan to live for 25, 30 more years, God willing? I mean, to me, that's not a year or two. So the idea here is, again, the concept of time. Believe it or not, the most powerful thing you can do in the investment world is not the shiny object that you got told was really good investment or this, that, and the other. It's a four-letter word. It's time. So again, this is just a backdrop on the U.S. stocks given in presidential election years. Again, based on a report and not indicative of future returns, but to give you an idea that volatility, if you know what you're looking for and you have a plan, back to my comment in the first part of the show today, if you have a plan, uncertainty and volatility in markets actually can be an opportunity. So I guess I want to put on your hearts now is if you think about where you are today and getting your house in order when it comes to your own spending in government, of your own governing, of your own financial household. And then you look at that in the time period of a year and say, well, Brad, maybe I'll just do it next year. I don't want to really get involved in the market this year because of election year and so on and so forth. Those are excuses you will always use. I've seen it time and time again. Again, time in the market, not timing the market. Hey, I want to thank you for listening to the Make Your Money Matter show. As always, before acting on anything discussed today, make sure to speak with a financial representative about your specific situation. Or if you'd like our help, you can reach us at 805 805- 410-5454 or on our website at onecapital.com. And until next week, always remember to make your money matter. The information in this show is educational and general in nature and does not take into consideration a listener's personal circumstances. Therefore, it is not intended to be a substitute for specific individualized financial, legal, or tax advice. To determine which strategies or investments may be suitable for you, consult the appropriate qualified professional prior to making a final decision.